All right. Welcome to August, everyone. And yes, I know we're already halfway through the month, but did you know that one of the observations this month is that it's National Water Quality Month? Now, we're not going to get into water quality so much today as we will water quantity. I mean, have you seen the drought monitor map recently? Yikes. But uh, it's pretty scary, especially if you look west of the Mississippi. Reservoirs of fresh water have sunk to record low levels. Homeowners seem kind of unconcerned, but is their confidence in plentiful water misplaced? It seems that we need some solutions. Are there new technologies that could enable homeowners to ride out the drought with minimal personal sacrifices? Well, good news is we've got Matt Power here to discuss things like leak detection, ultra low flow faucets and fixtures, gray water, rainwater harvesting, and smart irrigation. Now, we're also going to troubleshoot hidden water wasters, such as reverse osmosis purification, long-run hot water lines, swimming pools, and non-native lawns. Now, in case you don't know, Matt Power is the editor-in-chief of Green Builder Media. And it's largely because of Matt that Green Builder Magazine has been named residential, a best residential trade magazine near eight consecutive years from the National Association of Real Estate Editors. Matt has an award-winning, nearly three-decade career reporting on innovation and sustainability in housing. He has a long history of asking hard questions and adding depth and context as he unfolds complex issues. Now, before we dive in, oh, uh, water puns, I want to let you know today's webinar sponsors are Upanor North America is the partner plumbing and HVAC professionals rely on for smart water and energy solutions. An award-winning manufacturer of PEX piping and the exclusive marketer and distributor of Upanor PP RCT in North America, the company offers plumbing, fire safety, radiant heating and cooling, hydronic piping, and pre-insulated piping system solutions for new construction, for retrofits, remodels in the residential and commercial markets. Now, Power Shift by NV Energy is a program that helps residential and business customers conserve energy and save money on their power bills. Power Shift is a one-stop resource to find energy-efficient products and services. For more information, please visit their website, which is nvenergy.com slash powershift. Beko exists to empower new generations of homeowners to live healthier lives on a healthier planet. They created the industry's first Healthy Kitchen Council to help guide product innovations, and they are one of the most sustainable brands in the world. Now, why would I say that? Well, because three years ago, Beko's parent company became carbon neutral in global production operations, and they're the only home appliances brand to receive Energy Star designation every year they've operated in the United States. That's six years in a row and counting. Now, you are welcome to submit questions for our guest. Now, just use the questions box on the right side of your screen, most likely. It's the control panel over there. I'm going to review those questions and pose them to Matt during the Q&A time that we've set aside after his presentation. Speaking of Matt, Matt, it's always good to see you, sir. You too, Mike. Uh, great to see you, and uh, thank you for that introduction. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm on Eastern time. I'm not sure where you are, probably all over the world. Um, so today, uh, this is a, a topic that uh, is something that I, I write about quite on a regular basis uh, in different ways. Uh, this is going to be a little different than probably other webinars that you've gotten into. I tend to be, uh, as a journalist, I tend to sometimes sort of shoot from the hip, and I'm going to give you some sort of radical ideas in this about you know water usage and behavior and stuff that, that maybe I hope you haven't heard anyplace else. Uh, also, keep in mind that Green Builder is a magazine that goes out to both trade professionals, but also, I don't use the word consumers, but homeowners, home buyers, and just people, right? So I'm going to try to make this conversation suitable for both so you, so everybody gets walks away, I hope, with some, some good ideas that you can actually, you know, put into either how you're conserving water at your house or how you're building homes or designing uh, projects or even communities. So uh, let's let's get started. Um, how low can we go? That's the question. So let me start off. I'm I'm just going to briefly touch on where we are and why this is a cry. I don't want to get too much into the weeds about the the level of drought and the crisis, but I do think we need to touch on it at the beginning to show the urgency of water conservation. So everybody's seen these these pictures of Lake Mead. Um, 
you know, that, that, that picture pretty much says everything that I need to say. Um, I thought this was interesting. The U.S. Government Accountability Office has made some predictions about where things are going as this long-term drought continues with no sign of it letting up. There's also signs that, for example, the snowpack uh, had a lot less snow this year, so there's not relief uh, in the pipeline for this, this extreme drought situation. You're already seeing, uh, you know, a lot of tension in certain areas. Like uh, we have a house, a project house being built in Scottsdale, Arizona, and there's some actually some very strict water rationing going on in Scottsdale. It's actually affecting somewhat our project. Uh, so it's it, these types of sort of draconian measures are going to be more and more common. I, I also thought one interesting of these bullet points was the fact that. Um, the fresh water, water shortage can be related to climate change in other ways than just drought. If you look at the, this comment about Maryland, um, that sea levels would contaminate fresh water. So a lot of fresh water is in rather shallow aquifers uh, near the surface or storage reservoirs. And if, if those become brackish with salt water, again, you lose significant stores. So you may think you're, you're doing great and you've got plenty of fresh water and all of a sudden the lake where your city is supplied is no longer uh, potable. So uh, fracking, I also think deserves a call out. Uh, you know, people mistakenly, I think, believe that natural gas is sort of a, a renewable, I'm often hear it referred to weirdly enough as a renewable resource, but it's not, it's still a fossil fuel. And fracking, increasingly the evidence shows that it's polluting wells and aquifers across the country. It's one of the main reasons, honestly, that I'm, I'm opposed to, uh, uh, you know, continuation of natural gas harvesting is fracking. We don't have a good solution for fracking in terms of uh, water contamination. Um, this is just a quick look at, this is where the mat, this is from August 11th, so just a few days ago, this is where we stand with the drought situation. It's not just the West and Texas, obviously, uh, even the Northeast, you're seeing some extreme drought up in the Northeast, and uh, these are very, some, that Northeast pattern's very unusual, um, so I think it's something that we all need to be aware of as we, as we go into this presentation. Um, these are some other restrictions. My my opinion on these restrictions is this is minor stuff. Um, you know, like the no watering any day between 11 a.m. and 7. I think that that, and I'm going to get into this a little bit. The level of restrictions have been extremely, I'd say, cautious and conservative at this point. Um, the level of restriction that we may be facing could be a lot more dramatic and it also could happen quite rapidly. That's the other thing. This is not a uh, gradual process. Um, and, and that's part of the reason that we have trouble behaviorally and psychologically uh, doing a lot on our own with conservation. It's the way that water conservation manifests. So I did wanna uh, also point out that in this seminar or this webinar, we're only really talking about this public supply and domestic use uh, sectors of water use. If you look at where most water is used, and may maybe most people know this, but um, I, I wasn't aware that thermoelectric, for example, energy generation requires vast amounts of water. Now, it's a little bit un unfair to say that it uses it. A lot of like coal plants and other types of um, you know energy generators, the water is used for cooling and then it passes through and it's it's redistributed at a safe temperature, you know, into the local river or whatever. So it's not it's not like it's gone or turned into wastewater necessarily, but it is a lot of water that does get siphoned off and pulled off out of you know the same water supply, fresh water. Uh, just for example, and different uh, energy sources are not equal. Uh, it, one of the main reasons that, that uh, I've got a couple of reasons that I'm opposed to nuclear, and it's not just the, the, the waste. I, I get quite a lot of pushback from people saying, well, nuclear is clean. And in, in some respect, yes, other than the, it, but it's not just the waste. It's, it's the constant uh, maintenance, security, and the idea that a government is gonna be around 500 years to, from now to maintain the facility. But here's another reason 
um, maybe that, that nuclear is not such a great idea and, and that some of these fossil fuel sources um, need to be phased out. I mean, look how much water is required to cool coal plants and, uh, and nuclear plants and you know, now even natural gas to a lesser degree. Now, geothermal down at the bottom is a very low uh, water requirement you know, per uh, megawatt of electricity produced. So if you don't know about geothermal, that's just a quick graphic to explain, you know, extracting that uh, heat from the ground and, and using it, it requires very little water. But there's another technology that requires very little water and that's solar. Now you could say, well, in the manufacture of solar panels, yes, there's gonna be more water use, but in terms of, uh, you know, maintenance and an on an annual basis, there's estimate is that it's about uh, 20 gallons per megawatt hour, which covers basically cleaning the things and, uh, you know, uh, making sure that they stay at, at their optimal use. So it's all of these things. The reason I'm bringing this up is everything sort of goes hand in hand with uh, the direction that we're heading with, with climate crisis and our reaction to the climate crisis. And water conservation is just one big piece of it, right? But water conservation is tied directly in with energy. Um, I wanted to call out uh, uh, a, a city that is doing a great job, which is weirdly enough, Las Vegas. So that's, I don't know if anybody's been to Las Vegas, but that's one of the casinos, the Mandalay Bay. Uh, those are solar panels uh, on the roof of the Mandalay Bay. Now, Las Vegas, I believe, has just uh, crossed over or maybe a couple of years ago to be 100% renewable um, for the whole city, meaning they run basically everything in the city, all the buildings, et cetera. Now, a lot of these casinos are, are net zero as well too. So this thing, um, with the support of one of our sponsors, by the way, NB Energy, uh, Las Vegas is becoming sort of a showcase city of the fact that you know, it is possible to generate, um, generate your own power uh, in a clean way. Now, the other reason I brought them up is think about how dry Las Vegas is, right? You got a city in a desert, but because they're solar, they're not contributing to that water demand for uh, energy plants, right? So in a way, they're one of the most water conserving cities, as well as being, you know, one of, in one of the driest regions. Uh, because they've gone full renewable energy, they've, they've saved, you know, untold thousands of gallons of water a year, too. Okay, so let's get into the nitty gritty of this and look at uh, you know water usage in the household. And you know everybody's probably seen a pie chart like this. Um, it's uh, you know you see it you see it everywhere on the internet. And I, and I actually I, I'm going to call in the question a, a couple things on here. Like I notice and and Mike you know maybe at the end we could talk about this because Mike I don't know if anybody knows this is also somewhat of a water expert, but when they show this home use, I'm not sure where irrigation um, fits into that pie chart or whether it's sort of considered an outlier because irrigation is often 30% of your overall uh, household water use, but most of these charts do not include irrigation. So the way to approach this, the most obvious way is to start with the big chunks of the pie, right? And to, and to try to address those first and whittle our way down to the, uh, you know, the, the dishwasher, which is only using 1.6% uh, of your water supply. Now, here's, here's a headline that I see quite a lot, right? That, that, that Americans are conserving water and Americans are getting better and better about uh, water use. I actually challenge that, um, I think, for the most part, and I would say that with, with exception, there's certainly people we know that, that use water more frugally, that um, perception that people are using less water is them getting the benefit of technology and regulation that has improved that it makes them look good. But basically, and I'm gonna make this argument in this, is basically behavior hasn't changed much at all since about the 1960s. It's the tech and the, and the fixtures and the other stuff. So the reason I bring that up is if that's the case and behavior is not shifting, why do we have a fantasy that behavior is going to change in the future? There's no evidence to support the idea that people are going to get more and more conservative with their water use. So we're left with what can we do with tech, 
with, um, you know, where's the white space in terms of water savings and hidden water users that we can uh, take advantage of now and work on the behavior over the long term. So here to, to sort of illustrate my point, from 2011 to 2020, you can see that this is US, um, or actually this is St. John's River area uh, water use. Um, it varies very little. It's like two or three or four percent at most, up and down, up and down. So minimal uh, changes in fresh water use. However, and I threw this quote in here, before 2011, so so since 2001, there was this quote, gross gross water decreased, blah, 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 from 155 down to 100. So that was a big drop, 40 gallons per person per day. So why did that happen? Like, you don't even see that in this chart. Why did that happen before this, in like the, right at the end of the 90s? Well, I, I attribute a lot of it to toilets. Okay, so look at before 1992, you had toilets that used five to seven gallons per flush. Now they were a little slow as they as they ramped them up uh, in about 1992. I think was when it actually there were some mandates went into place. Um, it, it took a little while for the you know the the replacement of those to take place. So in that that uh, quote that I mentioned in 2001, where the numbers dropped, like the the water conservation dropped, I think it took a few years to ramp up. To from to these uh, 1.6 gallon per flush toilets. So we we dropped our toilet usage, which is one of those big pieces of the pie, uh, by about 60 or 70 percent. Um, high efficiency toilets today um, are they're considered I think 1.08 to uh, 1.28. I noticed at the I went to the Lowe's the other day and I was looking at toilets. That's what you know. That's what building editors do. And I noticed almost every toilet there was what, what I'd consider high efficiency at 1.28 gallons per flush. And uh, you know, part of the thing is they solved the problem of low flow uh, toilets clogging. The good ones like American Standard and uh, you know some some of the good brands uh, never had a problem with them. And I've talked to many plumbers and they said those things they they used to have problems, but they're They've really mastered the technology and uh, improved them. Now there's a couple of outliers like this Niagara Stealth toilet. It's a fairly new one. This is a 0.8 gallons per flush. I don't, I can't attest to, uh, you know, that that it, what the power of it is, but it does get a lot of good reviews. It's, it's, you know, again though, I, I don't want to get too much into um, sort of the the tiny increments of trying to save water. What I want to look at is some of the bigger stuff that we might have missed, right? And that technology hasn't addressed or yet and has the capability to address. Dishwashers, look at the 1965 dishwashers, right? So you were talking 16 gallons a load. Um, now we're up to what, gallon and a half, two gallons. So it really is, it really is true that uh, you know dishwashers compete and probably beat hand washing at this point. You know that's the that's the age old debate. Uh, clothes washers, same thing. Uh, look at the so so the federal standard where I said I said regulatory baseline. I think that's still the uh, basically that's that's what you have to build to right. There are a lot there are a lot of models that are better than that. But again, think about the vast amounts of water that are being saved by this technology. This is not people conserving. This is not people doing fewer loads of laundry. It's not people going to the bathroom less and flushing the toilets less. That This is the same use of equipment, but when the equipment drops from 12 gallons down to four gallons, uh, yeah, you're saving uh, huge amounts of water without actually having to do anything. Um, I wanted to give a call out. Uh, this is a Beko, uh, you know, super efficient front loading clothes washer. Another thing that happened is the the front loading technology uh, combined with you know better motors and so on really dropped both the water cost and the energy cost. I mean, look how little it costs to operate this unit for a year. I mean, that's that's pretty honestly almost insignificant in terms of your annual budget of uh you know so so again close these companies i think you know they they deserve some kudos because they've really solved a whole bunch of technical problems and they've 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 tweaked their design and their technology so much there's not honestly a lot lower they can go and 
it's in my view it's not really their responsibility to go lower we have to look elsewhere to other technology that hasn't caught up and to behavior so on top of the uh th this again is the clothes washers um, there's a whole bunch of variables that you throw in right with a clothes washer that are somewhat behavior related so look at for example if you use a, a washing machine a clothes washing machine at the coal a front loading washer at the cold cold setting bottom right corner uh you're gonna spend about you know 47 bucks a year on a on a typical model right so if you're not uh you know if you're using all hot water the hot water is going to triple your uh, energy costs right so i think again these are these are variables and many of these variables are controlled by what uh, consumer or you know i don't like that word but homeowner expectations are uh showers i want to talk about showers too and showers are another big chunk of that pie so again showers that were mandated down uh the the i think it's now 2.5 uh gallons per minute uh, volume there's a lot of psychology around showers and one of the problems is if you ask someone would you like to have a shower that only gives you you know 5.5 gallons per minute or uh 15 they're going to go for the 15 gallon per minute so the the one on the right i i it's sort of like one of those uh, those guns that's been illegally modified um and i don't know if this is illegal but this this water blaster i happened to stumble on this online where you can buy a modified shower head that shoots out 12 gallons per minute and unfortunately uh you know in in my experience that's the direction that a lot of homeowners go and when a homeowner talks to a builder they say I want to shower. I want to feel drenched in my shower. Now, uh, manufacturers have tried really hard to 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 come up with some technologies, and some of them are are really effective. Where they, for example, they blast air into the water, and it makes the shower feel more full. And I've tried these, and they they really are quite effective. Um, but I, I've also been a landlord, and I've had tenants go through and take my low flow shower heads out and put, you know. Uh, gigantic uh, sunflower shower heads on them because they don't like uh, the restriction. So um, again, a consumer behavior issue. This is, uh, you know, they they asked people, there was a, a bunch of research done on how people use showers and whether or not they, you know, whether men or women take longer showers and so forth. I think this this again tells you people estimate their personal water usage much uh, in a much more positive light than they actually conserve. So that, that's part of what came out of it. it there is not a giant um, difference between men and women in the shower. That's another sort of myth. Um, there is, however, a big difference between uh, your sort of teenagers and young adults. Uh, they do actually take a long time in the shower and uh, it's not your imagination that you've been sitting there for you know 15 minutes waiting for the bathroom. So um, Americans uh, do tend to shower frequently. Uh, a little more frequently than uh, than than much of the world. Uh, I did read that in some of the tropics they actually shower more frequently than us because it's so I, probably because it's so hot and humid. Um, again, just some psychological stuff related to um, showers. This again I, I, is another aspect of um, behavior and and why people conserve i just wanted to call out this is some pretty dense research i want to call out a couple things in here so over on the left you see the things that affect people negatively right so where if a person believes that that a, that farmers are wasting water they're less likely to conserve or especially or if they believe that their neighbors are wasting water they're again less so to, they really do uh, sort of look to the joneses to whether or not they're going to conserve um they if you look up at the top see the numbers if they're positive it means it has a sort of a positive effect on conservation so money does count pay less for consumption definitely has an effect he's they see the neighbors saving water um down and then down below uh if there's uh, water for the, where it says there's water for a few hours a day, what that is is that's restriction, right? So say there's restriction on water on your availability to get water, 
that is a positive motivator for making people conserve more, which kind of makes sense. On the far right, where it says annual consumption, that is if you tell somebody, hey, you used uh, this much water this year and this much water the year before, you used a lot more water this year than you did the year before, they don't care. All right, now there is a caveat to that, which is if you give them heads up display of their water use, they actually have been shown to adjust their behavior. But if you give it to them after the fact and compare year to year, they don't make any changes. It's insignificant to them. Now here's another part of my thesis about why there's not more conservation of water, because think about it, you're, you're, you hear about, you know, Lake Mead is low and there's a terrible drought and the, you know, cats and dogs are falling from the air, but until the tap actually runs dry, it's an abstraction, right? So it's a hard thing, I think, as humans, for us to get our heads around because we're told that water is getting low, but the water coming out of the tap doesn't look any different. The water we're spraying on our lawn looks just as clear and beautiful as it did last week. So this can create a real problem because we can get in a situation where suddenly the tap runs dry, at which point behavior will change dramatically because it'll be forced to. But without that, it's very difficult to get this change. So we again, we come back to technology and regulation. Uh, and now just to follow up on that, these are some some other research that was done where they tried to get people to take up sustainable you know, water conservation. And they said people would rather pay on a path of degradation and despair rather than choose an unfamiliar pattern. I mean, that's that's pretty depressing. But um, again, people want that. They like the idea of water conservation, but they really want someone else to do it. Okay, so leak detection, so 17% of that pie are from leaks, right? So it, it may actually be quite a lot higher than that if you include in uh, all the ir you know, irrigation leaks. And irrigation leaks also can go under, unlike house leaks, uh, or most big house leaks, can go undiscovered and you can have tens of thousands of gallons um, going out into your lawn and, and not be aware for some time until you get the bill. Um, Fortunately, there is new technology. So there's the old way of looking for leaks is, you know, there's a bunch of different things. You can watch your meter and see if it's moving. You can look for green grass areas on top of your, uh, your irrigated. You can add dye to the toilet. You can bring in an expert. Um, in the last few years, these leak detection uh, technology has come out. And if you're not familiar with it, what it does is it connects right at sort of where the uh, the service entrance of your water to your home. And then there's like an algorithm. So they, they, they create an algorithm of every device, every toilet, every sink, every faucet in your home. So it, it's a smart device and it senses, now I don't claim to know, understand this exactly, but it senses that every device is working as it should have. So say, you're away or you're at work and a pipe burst, um, you know, in your upstairs bathroom. This also has like this Fin Plus is, is one model, um, has a, and I believe that's a that's an Upinor uh, model, one, another one of our sponsors too. But there are other brands out there too. You can look at, like, there, there's several brands. It will shut off, this one sh has a shut off valve. So it instantly shuts that water off. Now, this is a big thing. Um, uh, we have a friend, I, I, he asked me not to name him because he's still in uh, sort of debating with the insurance company about this, but he uh, he had a leak in his house uh, a couple years ago and it was on the upstairs floor. He and his wife had to move out of the house for a year because it did so much damage. It was in California. Uh, the mold got in almost immediately. You know, none of the uh, air conditioning or dehumidifying systems work because the water, the the panel was flooded. So it was a huge um, disaster for him. And I think most of it ultimately will be covered by the insurance, but a lot of people don't have that level of insurance too. So the other thing I wanted to point out is the insurance companies are saying that more and more of these water damage claims are happening. Now, why is that? And um, that's gonna tie in with some of these conservation things. Uh, I, I will bring those two ends together in a couple minutes. So let me keep moving. All right, so first we're gonna we're gonna look at some of these hidden water wasters, and this is stuff that's you know it's, it's laying right there, and it's stuff that we could address now. And 
and again, notch down some of that water usage without a lot, honestly, of personal sacrifice, which it's really hard to get people to do. So let's get the tech stuff done first and save the personal sacrifice for, for the end game and hope that we don't have to use it. Um, long run hot water so what i mean by this is a lot of houses you know you have like a like a home run uh, hot water tank where it's located like in the basement on the other side of the house uh, i know i had a house like this where it took three or four minutes for the hot water to reach the shower this is pretty common uh, a lot of times like for example the pipes are not insulated or they're running through partially conditioned space so you can see the stats on there like huge millions and millions of gallons wasted every day as people run their hot water waiting for it to show up now think about this so you've got a, a clothes washer and you you want to wash some white clothes um, but you know, you might be able to run it on warm, cold, right? Normally, you you because maybe you're a nurse and you need to have some kind of sanitary washing condition. So you you do hot, cold, or warm, cold. Now, because you have a three-minute hot water delay, because that long distance throw, you have to run your washer on the hot setting, right? So that enough hot water will reach it within the after that three or four minutes to to do the close. So again, these are it's a um, sort of side effect of the long run hot water wastes uh, not only water but energy right because it's now wasting electricity as well as the person tries to to compensate for it now here's a simple solution um, these tanks so this is a four gallon electric um, both both of these are 120 volt models uh, i've hooked them up myself you just you literally you put them in line you plug them in and you put them somewhere near your uh, like your kitchen or your bath when i put mine in it not only allowed me to have instant hot showers it solved all of my dishwasher uh, you know cleaning problems it gave me instant hot water in the uh, laundry as well because it was sort of situated close to all of those i think it was you know it was, it was under Three, four hundred. I think that the one I put in was actually the EcoSmart. Now I had a ca caveat about that because after I think it was five years, the bottom simply dropped out of it. So here's one of the things about electric water tanks: like if they're not made out of stainless, don't have stainless steel tanks, they generally have a fairly short lifespan. So this thing literally, I think it had said it was a five or six, you know, year uh, warranty on it, if that, and um, it, it it only lived up to its warranty. It did not live a day beyond it. So fortunately, it was not a major disaster. It did a little bit of damage, uh, but I was able to, uh, you know, shut the water off before it could basically destroy the whole house. So again, if you're going to put one of these in, you might want to think about how having a water sensor system, like um, you know, even an inexpensive one of the battery powered Govee systems or something, leave it under that tank in that little closet or whatever. So you get an early alert if that thing starts to leak. Uh, here's another one. I, I'm sure if you don't have an RO, you, you, you may want to get one when you hear what, what I have to say about water quality. Um, reverse osmosis is the only thing that I know of that removes the, um, the PFAs that we're finding out are in everybody's water now, are one of the biggest um, you know, health risks out there. So, but these water uh, RO systems waste a lot of water. They waste, you know, between four times or three times and tw 20 times what you actually drink. So you draw a gallon of water out of that, you could be wasting 20 gallons of fresh water down the drain. Now, in places like Maine, where I live, there's not such a big deal. You know, we have ample water for now. Uh, but in you know, a place like Las Vegas or Phoenix, uh, that's that's a pretty big uh, chunk of water. You know, most people use around 100 gallons or somewhere in that range a day, um, you know, personal use. So that's uh, you know one fifth of your personal use, you know, in wastewater just to produce that water. There is a solution, however, for this. So. One thing, I, and I was not aware of this, but I put in a couple of these things. So the pressure of your system makes a big difference in how much water the RO wastes. So if you have, for example, a well that's, that, ha does, that has a you know, relatively weak pump on it, that's only you know, 30 PSI or something, 
you may not be getting enough pressure. I, I think actually some some uh, reverse osmosis membranes won't work if the pressure is below 45 psi. So you want to find out specific to the reverse osmosis system you get, what pressure does it need from the water in order to effectively work? Typically, a higher pressure is better. So in cities, uh, you might you typically get you know 50, 60 psi. And, and and here's another interesting thing. Sometimes the, the location in the city makes a difference. Like if you're at the bottom of a hill, you might get 100 psi. Uh, so that so your actual elevation can affect the the pressure in your pipes, which can affect a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so this little gadget you could mount if you have bad water pressure or, or not enough water pressure. You can mount this with your reverse osmosis, and it it jacks up your PSI so that all of a sudden you're only one to one ratio of fresh water. I thought I think that's a pretty neat little technical solution. Um, pools, you know, people don't talk enough about water waste and pools. So look at this. Um, I believe this was in Florida. This chart. So it's you know it's a fairly warm uh, place where you're going to have some extreme. Uh, you know, extreme evaporation. No, I'm sorry, this was California. I, I just remembered where I got it. That's a California pool. So it's 400 square foot pool. Uh, over the year, you're losing almost 20,000 gallons to evaporation. Now, and this is another one maybe for you at the end, Mike. I, I wasn't sure whether this is uh, pools, for example, are even accounted in household use in that pie chart. There's a little section called other which shows you know 5.2 percent, and maybe they throw it in there, but that's a pretty big uh, chunk. You know, that's that's like having an extra person using water. I think like you know in your household. So uh, again, it's uh, it's it's something that could be easily addressed. However, pool covers. So uh, Water Sense has just come out with a new standard for pool covers, or at least they were working on it last I heard. These things, you know, they're they're not that expensive. They cut the evaporation down by up to 95%. And if you live any place, you know, but the deep south, you may want to extend your swimming season anyway. They actually will warm the pool at the same time. So you get more usage out of the pool. So you notice I'm not saying everybody's got to get rid of their pools. I think these are this is the first step is that we can adjust some things with technology before we get to the the measures where you say, okay. You shut the pool down because there's not enough water. Let's try to avoid that. Okay, dumb irrigation, uh, another water waster. So these are sprinklers, I don't know if you can tell, that are on during a rainstorm. Um, part of the reason home sprinklers waste so much water is misuse. So people use them like in the in the heat of the day and they you lose like up to 60% of the water they're shooting out is evaporated if you use them at the heat of the day. The wind actually, oddly enough is, is pretty significant if it's a little breezy carries all the water away and also people wa water wrong uh, they water like you know twice a day for 10 minutes or every day instead they may want depending on the grass species they might want to water for you know 40 minutes every other day and that actually ends up being a, a more uh, frugal way to use water. So, and, and also these dumb systems don't have any awareness. So when it does start raining, they don't shut off, right? If you, even if you put them on a regular timer, they just keep going. Pretty easy fix here. There's there's companies like, this is Rachios. There's a couple different, uh, I think Rainbird makes one now, smart sprinkler systems, right? So they had, they're linked up to a GPS and you tie them in with your irrigation and they shut the sprinklers off if it's gonna rain, you can also tie them in with soil sensors. So they will actually tell you, you know, if the if the soil is getting dangerously dry, it will, uh, you know, again, supply the necessary water for it. Drip irrigation, I'm a big fan of, of, of it as a um, technology. Executing it is kind of a, um, a mixed bag though. I mean, I, I'm, I, I would advocate for it, but at the same time, what I've run into is, unless this, it's done with sort of professional gear, you can run into a lot of problems with, uh, for example, rodents and mice will eat through the lines um, and you can get a leak. Uh, have, have it, rather than try to DIY this, I would say, you know, pay somebody to come in and do this irrigation, drip irrigation for you. And especially, it's not drip irrigation isn't really for lawns, it's for trees, shrubs, 
plant, uh, you know, it's a great solution for those. And if it's used for that, I think it's an excellent solution. It uses far less water than than uh, sprinklering. However, and I wanted to get into this a little bit because because there are some negatives to all of this, all of this good spirited um, effort to you know cut back on water use has had some unwanted and unpleasant side effects. That is a copper pipe you're looking at, and that is chlorine damage. So what's happened is because water sits longer in the pipes, so think about it, you know, it used to be you were, you were flushing at 5.6 gallons per minute and water was just ripping through there every time somebody flushed. Now, there's so little water moving through the house fixtures that it sits inside the copper pipes in your building. The other thing that's happened is they have added um, other chemicals. Let me see if I have a... Oh no, that's not the one. Uh, well, I will catch up with it in a minute. There, I think it's called chloramine. It's a it's a mix of um, chlorine and ammonia, and it's a cleaner, right? So it's used to clean the the pipes out. But it's a stronger. Uh, it has a stronger chemical effect on copper. It actually eats at the inside of the pipes, not just the joints. So there's a lot of negative uh, sort of health aspects with this, but also the potential for catastrophic failure. So I'm going to get into a little bit, um, you know, there, fortunately, the plastic type pipes like the PEX plumbing and uh, CPVC uh, are, seem to be much more resistant to this. They're, they're especially, the, the PEX I know is specially treated to resist chlorine and the CPVC, I think just because of the way it's made has chlorine in it. So it tends to be naturally resistant. So these uh, seem to hold up better than the, than the copper. So it's all is not lost, except you may have to replace your plumbing if you've got a house uh, with uh, with super low uh, flow fixtures on it and all plum old plumber pipe uh, old copper pipes rather. Um, here's another sort of backlash effect. This actually happened to me. So I bought an older home a while ago, and uh, and the had a bad leak spring. This was in the upstairs bathroom down in the kitchen. I ripped the ceiling out of the kitchen and 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 thought maybe the drain pipe had let go. What it turned out to be was the previous owner had put a low flow faucet head on the uh, onto this old tub. Now what happens with these old plumbing joints, it's not that they can't handle the pressure necessarily, but there's a, there's a hammer effect because they're used to just not having a lot of resistance and they go right out, the water goes right out that shower head but you cut that shower flow in half and the water, when you pull up that uh, little lever on your, on your spout, it hammers into those pipes. And you can see in the illustration, the water actually shoots out the handles now. Right? So I actually had to not only pull that spout out and uh, you know, re reattach it with some Teflon, uh, but also replace the low flow shower head for now with faster flow. Uh, because the, the old plumbing just just couldn't handle it. So you know sometimes you run into unexpected problems like this when you're when you're trying to do the right thing. This is another uh, aspect of this some of the changes in the way that that we're managing water. Uh, the, there's a lot of chemicals, and they think part of it might be because they're using more chlorine and stuff in the water, right? It's the municipal pipes as well as our home pipes are actually uh, degrading and we have a lot more stuff in them. So what this then leads you back to is reverse osmosis, right? So honestly, uh, my recommendation would be until they really get a handle on this, there is no, uh, you know, or unless you have the document right in front of you, I would not, I wouldn't feel safe with the drinking water in many parts of the country. I would put an RO filter on, just for safety's sake, especially if you have young kids, um, because frankly, the, the data is has not been testing for PFAs, for example. Uh, not every place has been fully tested for lead. Um, homes, another aspect of homes, in your home, you have different quality water in different rooms. So, uh, you know, the, the water might be perfectly fine in your kitchen after you turn the tap on for 10 seconds, but you go take a, a drink of water out of your bathroom tap at night before you go to bed, you might be chugging a mouthful of lead from, from the lead joints in your copper pipes that's been sitting all day long. So not to terrorize you, but it, you know, it's just, just good stuff to know. Um, so what, do we, what else can we do? 
uh, this is Las Vegas again. They they pulled out all the green strips of their meridians and they put art in there instead, which I thought was a, a kind of a cool solution. I mean, not everyone likes the xeriscaping look, but you know, when in Rome, you you live like a Roman, and uh, and they're they're doing Las Vegas is really showcasing how to make the most of small amounts of water. Um, let's talk a little bit. Uh, you know, Las Vegas. I remember when I used to go there. Used to be lawns everywhere, and I really don't see them much. But I want to talk about lawns because lawns. Most people really, really don't want to give up their lawns. So I did some research just recently, um, a couple of weeks ago, about what lawns can, like how long can a lawn survive in extreme drought? Uh, and, it, and it really comes down to a couple of things. So um, if you look at this chart, which comes from an old, it's like the Bible of a lot of uh, sort of landscape, um, you know, landscape architects and that sort of thing by James Beard. Uh, science and culture. He's one of the only ones that sort of did an analysis of different kinds of grass. So if you look at this chart up at the top, those those four species are the most drought resistant. Now, uh, you know, so so what that probably means if you get into this some of the stuff down closer to the bottom, uh, you're not going to last long. You know, when when the city says you know you can only water once a week. Uh, you may be looking at, you know, a, a rapidly dying lawn. And what happens is um, lawns reach a permanent, or, or like all plants, reach a permanent wilting point. And when they reach that permanent wilting point, that's when the roots die. Now, they can die back a bit, or, or they, can, they can brown up and go dormant. I shouldn't say die, because they haven't died yet. But if that water gets to a certain level, and it might not even be like, you know, 100% dry, uh, that's called the permanent wilting point, and those plants will not recover, and they won't come back no matter what amount of water. And that, at that point, you really have no option. You can't. You simply can't have a lawn there. But here's the thing: everybody still wants lawns, right? So the we. It's funny. We we did a project with millennials last and I last year, and I was really surprised to find that millennials want lawns even more than their parents. Okay, so millennials is a pretty big group now. I think they go all the way up to age 40. So they're kind of the home buying group now, but they, they'll they give up everything else, but they don't want to give up a lawn. So, you know, how do we how do we compromise? How do we find a, something, some way around this so they, they can still enjoy their yard and, and, and feel like they didn't have to make all sacrifices and they don't hate us for being, you know, their parents? Um, Here's one idea, and I, and I know some people will blanch at this, is, is these, you know, sort of what they call, they used to call AstroTurf, right? And I was sort of, had always been pretty negative about this stuff, um, and partly because the industry that makes all the AstroTurf for the football fields hasn't done a good job with recycling them. They, they've instead, they've, they've created, you know, millions of yards of this stuff, and they don't have a good system for recycling them. This company I, I like, it's called Forever Lawn. Um, I think it's DuPont owns it at this point. But they use recycled materials in their backing layers. And the the top layer is the only one that's not recycled, I believe, although it's technically recyclable. Now, I've played around with these a little bit. And this stuff actually looks and feels a lot more like real grass, too. So my thought is, why can't you have a sort of a treat lawns instead of treating them as this vast carpet that covers your whole lot your whole landscape why not treat them as sort of special boutique areas on your property where you have a little area where you can get your feet in the grass you can sit down you can play with your kid or your grandkid um, and this synthetic grass has a lot going for it i mean it doesn't require you know water it doesn't require pesticides or not require you don't use or be tempted to use pesticides herbicides um i actually have a little piece at, at my house and it's about 10 by 10 and what i do is every season i take i pick it up and i bang it off i've used it for three or four years it's still holding up and i, I put it back down on some on some rubber pads and it's soft feels just like grass it's great um so they're, they're not one of the sponsors of this. They, I just like this company and I like this idea. Uh, you know, this is this some some thinking out of the box ideas for you. This is another thing. I remembered this study. Um, you know, some people will say, well, it's not real. I want real. Well, you know what? I, I, I have this expression I used to use, which is reality sucks because I was a filmmaker for quite a while. Because 
they did this study of uh, prisoners where they put paintings up of trees and forests and landscapes, and they found that the paintings and the pictures had the same impact as are almost the same impact as the real thing in terms of positive mental health. Now, I'm not, I'm not advocating that we, you know, that we give up nature or anything like that. I'm just saying we could compromise a little bit, have some green space in our yards, use a lot less water, and get sort of get what we want um, without necessarily, you know, sacrificing our, our future. Here's another thing I, I did. So I, I think of this as sort of a, a positive thing is we don't need a lot of water in terms of potable water to drink, right? So a human being, some people say it's less, it's like, you know, eight cups. I see a whole bunch of different estimates. We can live on, you know, certainly less than a gallon, maybe as little as eight cups of water a day. So there's a lot of angst about, you know, how, what we do about water. Now, water affects so many other things, right? So you're saying that's an ultra simplification, right? It affects, you know, our food supply, our, you know, everything. Um, but we're not generally, what, what's going to kill us is probably not dying of thirst. Okay, so that's an anxiety you can take off the table. It's going to be all the ancillary things of, 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 you know, lack of water for other things, right? Can make life, for example, uh, that's the Great Salt Lake. And I don't know if you've heard, but it's, you know, the water's going down and down. And e even though this is a little bit off, off topic with the fresh water, when that water goes, um, you know, one of the predictions is windstorms are going to sweep over that thing and lift all the arsenic dust and throw it all over Salt Lake City. So again, it's the unexpected consequences that we, conservation is is still worthwhile because we don't, honestly know what's going to happen if if we essentially we may be fighting change by continuing business as usual but change is going to come for us at that point so i want to review some so here's some just just basic strategies let's let's make sure everybody sort of got your the, the notes on these of some things that we could do now uh, or that we're already doing that we can crank down our water use even more so um, the appliance upgrades, that's, that's an obvious one. Um, the reverse osmosis pressure system, let's pressurize those. Uh, I would upgrade if you, if you, not many people have the old toilets, but you need to upgrade to a high efficiency one. Uh, the shower is a more complicated one, but here's the thing, showers get, get re, what do you call it, uh, renovated on average every seven years. They're the most renovated part of a home. So if your shower, if you're looking at the shower and you got some mold in the grout, maybe it's time to do the overhaul. And um, while you're at it, put some new, uh, you know, PEX plumbing in there or CPVC and uh, you get rid of that copper, make sure that plumbing is, is up to snuff so that you can put a low flow shower head in there. So you'll end up with a, with a net win in terms of water saving. Use, you know, get some of these new tools to detect leaks. Um, the, the hot water one is, is easy. Um, the, the upgrade plumbing supply, I realize this is a difficult because, you know, what if you've got a house and you've got copper lines running all through it? I mean, that is one of the things I like about PEX is, um, you know, I use it a lot and I use I use that and, you know, other, I use CPVC as well, but PEX will wind through things. You can, you can bend it quite a lot and, uh, it's fairly DIY friendly and you can replace copper pipes actually a, a lot easier than you think. I mean, certainly you can get a plumber in to do it. Some of the easy stuff you may be able to do yourself. Uh, and, and lastly, this is base stuff, cover the pool. Um, some other stuff though, uh, behavior wise, if you only get your water bill every four months, uh, which a lot of places do apparently, um, people tend not to conserve unless they can see it like right in front of them. So I would say go even further and get some kind of a heads up metering system that tells you exactly how much water, you know, even have it inside the house. So on a daily basis, you can check it and, and see if you're hitting, make it a game where you're hitting conservation targets. Um, that's the heads up display that I was talking about. Uh, rethink the lawn. Um, you know, you can go zero, zero escape, which is, you know, with native plants and you get rid of all the grass. Uh, I think you're going to get a lot of pushback from, especially from young people who were, you know, have dreams of the 
uh, the picket fence and the you know house in the suburbs but maybe we can uh, mitigate that with some you know m convincing them that that some synthetics are, are the way to go although i i do think we should keep the pressure on the synthetic grass companies i think they can do better too i think they can recycle more and use more recycled content so i think that's that should be a push pull uh, here's another more more draconian thing. You know, if you're um, you have teenagers at home or whatever. One one thing I did on my house, I went from a 66 or 60 or 90 gallon uh, hot water tank to a hybrid heat pump hot water that's 40 gallons. I had to special order it from Ream. So, but by doing that, I uh, I reduced the um, tendency to take you know 30 minute showers because at some point you run out. Um, I don't know, maybe some people think that's too extreme, but again, I told you I was gonna have some radical ideas for you. Um, also, I, I really like this company, and there's not honestly a lot of companies out there I would trust to do gray water. These are, they're not a sponsor of this, but we have worked with them in the past, a company called Greater. They have a really cool, the, the guy who runs it, so you know, it's a pretty small company, but they've really worked on the tech. So this thing has all kinds of systems for cleaning gray water you know one of the problems with gray water has been you know you don't want it to stink and you want to make sure it's safe well this thing the water goes through it and, and it comes out um certainly you know at a, at a high quality near they say near potable so you could certainly use it even for you know plants and landscaping and toilets and other stuff you know they say um i don't know if they go as far as showers yet but but yeah anyway it's it's probably the best gray water system i've seen uh, and I and I will I know I'll get some people yelling at me if I don't mention rainwater. I am a big fan of rainwater collection, um, uh, and, and I haven't got into it a lot because I, I honestly I think it's sort of obvious. Um, and if you do it, you're already sort of a believer. But one thing they have found that when people do uh, have their own rainwater systems at home, it does help mitigate, like gives them a lot more resilience in drought times because they can sort of capture a reserve. Even if it sits there, it can be, um, you know, cleaned after the fact or chlorinated to, to make it safer, uh, you know, for at least for most household uses, probably not, not to the point of potability perhaps, but uh, definitely it's worth looking. And you can collect a vast amount of rainwater in a, even in a drought period where there's you know maybe there's one rainstorm every three months depending on your roof size you might pick up 1500 gallons of water that's pretty su substantial that'll keep you going for a while and i'm going to wrap it up there i think i'm i've, I've blabbed on enough and and hopefully uh, give you some ideas and, and open it up for questions and also i'd invite if it's something that that i can't that I don't know, uh, Mike, like I said, is very involved with the code and uh, water sense issues. So Mike, feel free if, if it's something I don't know, maybe you can uh, grab the question too. Sure, yeah, I, uh, I echo uh, Matt's comment there about sending your questions now. Um, wanted to, I guess, add a couple things if I could, Matt. Um, yeah, sure. Um, I think, you know, you talked a little bit about the, uh, the small instant hot water system that you put in the uh, EcoSmart, yep. um, you know, there's a couple other uh, technologies. If you've got an issue where you've got an existing house and long runs of plumbing, um, and you don't want to redesign the plumbing system. Um, one would be um, you, you can do a research system where it kind of just uh, circulates hot water kind of around um, and it shortens that structural waste. Uh, time it, it, it uh, right. reduces the loss. That'd be more expensive than your EcoSmart, but um, and your your instant hot water tanks like what you did. Um, but yeah. it is an option. Then yep. the yep. other thing that came to mind was um, uh, something called a TSV, which stands mm -hmm. for a thermostatic shutoff valve. So this is something that can be applied to a shower head, and all it does is just once the uh, water reaches temperature, meaning warm or hot, um, it slows the uh, flow of water down greatly. And, and okay. it's a fairly simple device that you can, uh, you can get integrated to a shower head. And what this does is, at least what studies have found, is that people who have um, showers where it's maybe the furthest fixture from the hot water heater, and it may take a minute or two for them to get hot water, they'll turn that water on 
And then instead of standing there and waiting for as soon as it gets hot, they will go do something else. They'll right, maybe pick right. out their clothes for the day. They'll go make a cup of coffee. They'll go catch a segment on a morning TV show or who knows what, check their phone. And now all of a sudden, instead of, you know, being there when that hot water is ready at the one to two minute mark, now they're walking in at the five minute mark. Right. So now right. they just do three to four minutes of water just going right out of that faucet, whereas the TSV would slow that rate of uh, flow way down. And it's also kind of this audio uh, signal. Hey, wait a minute. I don't hear the water flowing as much. Ah, that's because it's ready. So right. that's right. a really inexpensive device that you can you can go for. Um, I one. wanted yep. to get to also your question, Matt, about um, the the pie chart you showed earlier. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, it seemed that that pie chart was merely representing indoor water use, that there really wasn't an exterior water use component to that pie chart. Yeah, which, I, that's that's probably right. I, that, that was, but I I wasn't sure why they. Because there's no pie chart specifically for home exterior, you know, uh, de dedicated strictly to home exterior. It's sort of it's sort of left out of the conversation. Right. Yeah. And 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 it depends on where you are in the country as to the percentage of your, well, your water use. So if you're in a place that gets copious amounts of rain, like where I live here in the Midwest, um, well, I don't have an irrigation system at all, so I don't irrigate my lawn. Uh, Mother Nature does it for me. Now, my neighbor right next to me does have an irrigation system. I'm not really sure why, but they do. And uh, right. I'm not sure what their percent water use would be versus indoor, but I'm guessing it's going to be south of 50%. Um, mm. However, if you live in a very arid place like the southwest, um, you may see you're a great, you know, a very high percentage of your water use going to exterior just to have whatever plant life you're wanting to have out right. there, whereas your interior use is going to be relatively minimal, especially with some of the newer technology that you hit on. Um, right. And then I wanted to make a comment too on pools. So you talked about pool covers. Um, yeah. So I had a very smart, uh, smart guy that I know in the industry um, uh, who said to me, he goes, you know, we, we did a study once um, of pool covers. And what we found is that, if it's a manual pool cover, people don't use them. Ah, good they just, to know. Yeah. They, won't, they won't put them on. They, it's, it's too much work or whatever Not it is. They, they don't take it on and off, on and off all the time. So they'll do it typically twice. They'll, they'll put it on at the end of the season, and then they'll take it off at the beginning of the season. Automated pool covers, though, where all you got to do is push a button, are used way more. That's good, and so. Yeah. Those water utilities, after seeing that study, were like, okay, if you get an automated pool cover, then we do think there's actually some, uh, you know, conservation facet yeah. to that because you're reducing the amount of evaporation. Right. And I, I think what you're going to run into, and this is always the problem with those, you know, behavior issues, is there's going to be a bottom dollar cost, right? There's going to be there where they're going to go, how much is this costing me? And, and yeah. how much is my water bill? And unfortunately, water bills don't reflect the scarcity of water sometimes, right? So the water bills are still pretty low, and they're like, "Well, I'd, I'll just I'll live with it, right?" And and this is the what we're up against is if water is priced at a low rate, uh, putting in an automatic pool cover is not going to essentially not going to happen, except for people who are really you know devoted to water conservation, which is the small minority. So yes, yeah, so I, I hear you, and that, that's again those behavioral things. Those are the hardest nuts to crack. I did want to mention one thing about your recirculating pump that you mentioned. Um, with both the point of use uh, tank and the recirculating pump, so you can have a little bit of extra electrical cost, right? Because both are going to run on electricity. I think that the, the the point of use thing is about thirty, maybe like thirty bucks a year extra, right? So there is a cost to it. I suspect the recirculating pump might be a little less than that, right? So, but but again, you, I'd have to do, I haven't done the research on that, but it's something for our audience. I'd compare the cost of those because you're going to pay extra either way um, for that little bit of uh, electricity. So, correct, uh, correct. And um, one other thing to mention too, Matt, is that um, you mentioned rainwater. Um, and uh, that's an interesting topic because it depends on where you are as to how much you can collect. 
Right, so, right. Uh, There's rules. Colorado is a famous example. Um, yeah. You get, get two rain barrels, you know. <laughs> uh, um, uh, it's a water rights issue out west, but other places don't have uh, quite that that kind of uh, small restriction. Right. Um, but the other thing to keep in mind um, is always pay attention to your local codes, because as a, here as a resident of Illinois, um, I don't believe they've changed the, the plumbing state plumbing code yet to where you cannot bring water inside the house. It doesn't okay. matter how it's filtered or whatever, water cannot come into the house. So if you're collecting rainwater, that's fine. You got to use it out there. You got to keep it out oh, there. It has to stay use it for, out. For gate, okay. Use it for car washing, use it for whatever yep. you want outside the envelope of the building. So yeah. um, always pay attention to those local codes. Good to know, good to know. Um, any other, uh, did you get any questions from uh, anybody in the audience? Got anything you were thinking about during the talk or? Um, I don't have any questions from the audience. I think uh, they're enjoying listening to us kind of chat about this stuff. And I think you hit on a lot of things that <clears throat> would, would certainly come to mind and, and, and some additional things that people wouldn't have thought about. Um, and that's the key is that um, where is this going, right? right. So um, we've seen, and, and I think you've seen this too, Matt, and some of the things that you read, that you know, we have some places where they had to put in brief, but still they had to put in moratoriums and say, hey, yeah. wait a minute, we're, yeah. we're not sure about the water situation. We don't want to start, or not start, continue to permit until we understand where we're at with water. Um, right. And right. so that's that's the thing that you really want to try and avoid if you're in the building industry is a complete shutdown of building altogether. So um, we, we talk about incentives, we talk about codes and regulations, even farther on that spectrum is just shutting it down altogether. So right. whether it's you know financial incentives or it's some kind of code of regulation, uh, to me, those are the two paths that, that our industry needs to get familiar with and yeah start to embrace because I think if you if you just say ah it's not a problem it'll be fine you eventually get to the point where some bigger measure has to take place and I think right. that's where you get really negative effects on all of us right at the point when you're literally that you, you open the tap and the water's off there's no water uh, I think that's a panic that's a panic moment right that's when right. You, you get in your car with your water bottles and flee and hopefully we never get there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, um, the, the other thing I was going to say too, Matt. You know, and this is again, we're we're talking way down the road. And I'm I'm fortunate that I'm able to uh, be one of the uh, co-founders and co-producers of the Next Generation Water Summit. And and that event, we look really ahead into the future to see, okay, what's what's coming down the road in a little while. Um, and one of the things that I think we're going to be talking about at next year's event is <clears throat> this idea of black water. Well, I shouldn't yep. say the idea of black water. Black water exists. But and, separating and, water, right? Separating. Again, were you going to say separating? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Con conjunctive water. So yep. uh, the separation of... <clears throat> and I hope nobody's eating right now, but uh, uh, the water <laughs> in, the, in the urine. So yeah. you can separate that out and reuse the water. What else is interesting though about this is from what I'm learning already and I will learn more in the year ahead, then they take the nitrates and the nitrogen out of it and use it as fertilizer. Fertilizer, yep. So, That's a medieval, I mean, the medieval uh, the farmers used urine in many different ways for dyeing and for fertilizer. And so, I correct. mean, another thing I, you know, I did not touch on because I, I, again, I found most people are not ready for that conversation are composting toilets, for example, which very minimal, you know, water usage. And I know people who are very happy with them. I, I think they're very viable. But again, I don't think that the uh, one thing I, w I would like to see more use of, for example, um, is bidets. Bidets, uh, not for direct usage, but uh, you know, every sheet of toilet paper requires two gallons of water to produce, every little square. So 
uh, you know, by using a, a bidet, you cut actually cut overall water consumption, not so much in, in your home, right? But in the big picture, you save vast amounts of water. So there's so many different directions like that we could go, uh, you know, and I, I that, that you know, we could talk all day about stuff like that. But no one wants <laughs> right. to hang out that long. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I, I am glad you brought up the, the topic of bidets. I know you've talked about it before. You didn't today, but I knew you have in the past. And so it was yeah. good to drop that mention in there real quick because um, yeah. it is an important and interesting stat, especially when you're looking at it from the larger macro level. Um, yeah. So here is one question um, that did come in here, Matt. Um, it's from Phil. He wanted to know if, if we um, are working directly with water districts to implement some of these things. Uh, he's out in Colorado and, uh, and and he's trying to figure out what is our recommendation on approaching water districts with some of these ideas. He's in the energy rating industry um, mm -hmm. and there seems to be more interest uh, for some of these kind of solutions out in the West, he's saying. So how do you go yeah. about approaching your local water utility or water district? And, you know, I, I mean, honestly, you, you, you may have more expertise and we do deal, we work with utilities, for example, NB Energy is, a, you know, the, one of the sponsors today. So we work quite frequently with utilities. Utilities generally, you'd be surprised how on board they are. Uh, you know, if you come to them with a good idea and it's often, it's just a phone call, uh, they're kind of, I think they're literally sitting around going, what else can we do? A lot, I won't say, I, I'd say in the South, that may not be true. I've dealt with Duke Energy and they're not, they're sort of the opposite. Um, but I'd say in the West, uh, you're gonna, people are gonna be open to uh, any ideas you have about water conservation. There's you know, a lot of rebate programs already um, in existence for everything from heat pumps to, you know, on the energy side, there's all, and this, this uh, gentleman's an energy rater, so he knows there's all these rebates. I think that the, um, the the water side, water management districts, should get involved in the rebate business more. For example, I don't think they're they've gotten as much as the energy side. If you offered rebates on certain pieces of equipment, like uh, you know maybe those little pumps that burst you anytime you buy an RO filter, they uh, you know they throw in one of those little pressure boosters, right? Or um, maybe they have a, a rebate program connected with you know, swimming pool cover, they could, it, you know, sort of the sky's the limit. They could come up with connections that would, I think rebates talk because it's money, right? So, so if the utility or the water management people were willing to get involved at that level, I think they'd find a willing audience. So I'd, I'd, I'd start there and talk about some ideas and say, hey, what do you guys think about, you know, this idea for a rebate or a, you know, a connection? Yeah, it's, Phil, it's a good question to ask because um, there are certainly some water utilities out there that are doing exemplary work. Um, uh, a couple that come to mind are uh, San Antonio, San Antonio Water System down in Texas, Denver Water, um, Southern Nevada Phoenix. Water Authority. Yeah, yep. Phoenix, Phoenix Water. water too. Yep. yep. Um, there are also, though, uh, unfortunately, a couple out there that what they do is they, they look at it and they say, hey, if I sell more water, I make more revenues. And I want to I want to make more revenues, which is counter right. to conservation. And so it's getting, it, it kind of depends on the water utility that you're talking to. Um, sometimes it's uh, more of a hand-holding effort than others because if they have that mindset of, oh, I need to sell more water to make more revenues, it's a, it's a bit of a challenge to, to make them kind of see that that's, kind of counter to what's going on. And, and, and there are messaging um, ideas out there. I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I go to Water Smart Innovations that's a conference every year. And uh, they've addressed this very topic multiple times because they yeah. recognize not everybody's on the same level as a Denver Water, a Phoenix, a SAWS. Yeah. And, and Mike, could, could people get access to like uh, recordings of the, that water conference? I bet that would be there might be some good stuff there. Is, there. is there a website or a place where they could get, watch videos from that conference, that sort of thing? Yeah, so Water Smart Innovations is the name of the conference. They have a, a wonderful website. Um, the pandemic um, made them record and post 
webinars online and during the pandemic, I think it was two years in a row, 2020, 2021, um, that was the only way you could see the sessions were online. It was free of charge. Yeah. Anybody could check it out. What's interesting about Water Smart Innovations is prior to the pandemic, it wasn't that they recorded it, but, and I, I'm a former presenter at that event, mm -hmm. your slides were available to download off their website and they have an archive, a running archive of their entire conference, their entire history of their conference. So hmm. you can see at least the slides, you don't get the, the, the yeah. person talking, but you can see the slides. But like I said, you do have some recordings from the past couple of years. Now they have started resuming in person and I don't think they're recording the ones in person and posting those anymore, but there is a body of work on their website that you can go back and look at and get some help with messaging depending upon the water utility you're dealing with. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it seems like some of those would be good stuff to say, hey, somebody else has done this in another city, here's how they did it. You know, take that case study, present it to your water district and say, this was successful, you know, and, and throw your own ideas in too. So. That's right, that's right. So I don't see any other questions, Matt. Um, so uh, any final yeah. thoughts from you? Uh, no, I, uh, I thank everybody and thanks uh, for hanging, those of you who hung in there with us and um, I'm always accessible. Just if you something comes up and you and a question you wish you asked, just email me, matt, matt.power at greenbuildermedia.com and um, check us out on the web. We you know do regular blogs and, and articles and videos and conferences and you name it. <laughs> so uh, anyway, thanks everybody. Thank you, Mike, and uh, I'll see you next time. Yep, and I want to make sure to say thank you to uh, to our audience as well, and uh, also to Upanor and to PowerShift by NV Energy and Beko as well for their generous sponsorships. Now, have you heard about the Housing 2.0 program? If not, it's an educational program that empowers building professionals to design and construct higher performance, healthier, more sustainable homes at a fraction of the cost. Now, if you have heard of it or you're intrigued by what I just said, you can register for the third workshop series. That six-part series will begin on Thursday, November the 3rd at 12 p.m. Eastern Time, and it will run for just about six weeks in a row. Uh, we'll skip over Thanksgiving, of course. Um, but if you want to find out all the information on the program, simply go to greenbuildermedia.com slash housing dash two dot zero. All right. Until next time, stay safe out there and take care, everyone. So long.